listeners to another edition of Pure Picks. I'm your host, James, and we're here to break down UFC 300. Alex Perea versus Jamal Hill. It's going to be an exciting card, a great event. Before we get to that, though, as we always do, I want to recap last week and how we did. Overall, it was a down week for us. Uh, we had some plays on the live, but honestly, we were down units at the end of the day. So I wanted to just go over some of the plays that were great, some of them that were not. First off, Lucas Bresky versus Walter Walker. We had a unit plus 190 there. I think that was a great play. It was a good fade on a heavyweight that came in with a debut and just really a game and a style that the judges do not like anymore. You're seeing a lot of these nut hugging, grappling fest, and you know the judges don't like that anymore. So they'll they'll go with the damage. They're going to like the the stand up battles. That's what the judges want to see going forward. And we saw that with the scorecards. Lucas Bresky had a 29-28, and I scored that myself for him as well. So I'm glad that we were on the right side for that. Another play that I want to highlight was Cesar Almeida to win. We had a money line play on him. I think that that was also a great... It was just literally the same thesis that I had for the Lucas Bresky fight, right? Dylan Buka was another one of these debut wrestlers who... I didn't really see much finishing ability from him via sub and his wrestling to me at least was not that great. So I thought that was an easy play on Cesar Almeida and the new meta is to, you know, throw these elbows <laughs> at these guys. Uh, I, I feel like sometimes you can even throw the elbows at the back of the head and the ref won't even call it. Cause I really do think the UFC is trying to cleanse a lot of these nut huggers out of the UFC and, you know, kind of prop up the stand-up people. So I'm glad we were on Cesar Almeida there. The loss that I had, um, actually, uh, we had Trevor Peak. You know, scorecards equals no action. So we had Trevor Peak inside distance decision, no action. That was a pretty good f- a fight. I mean, I-, I thought Trevor displayed his dog value. He still lost 30-27, though. I mean, Charlie Campbell was just a better fighter there. And I'm glad that we didn't do the money line because... I even you know said in my notes that Trevor Peak, if this goes to the decision, Charlie Campbell is the much better minutes fighter, and I wouldn't want to be caught up in the money line play on on Trevor Peak. So I'm glad that we were able to do inside the distance decision no action to save us that unit and not lose any units there. The loss that I had that I wanted to talk about was the parlay. It was Victor Hugo Silva and Alex Hernandez. Hugo was the right call. I, I thought that. It was just ridiculous that this, uh, I forgot what his name is, like Falco, was, they just literally found this guy off the street a few days before the event, and people were taking dog action on him. Um, you know, it was still a, somewhat of a close fight, but I think that was Vico, Victor Hugo all day, and it turned out to be true. My one big regret was laying juice on a guy like Alex Hernandez. Uh, never again. Uh, I've been burned by him. I think this is the first time I've truly been burned by him because I, I uh, did the right thing and never really laid the juice on him in the past. But, man, yeah, I think I, I'm done uh, laying any kind of juice on him. Even as a underdog, I'm, I'm not going to touch him in terms of the units. I just feel that right from the start of the fight, he looked like the underdog. And Damon Jackson looked like the minus 200 favorite. So that, that just was not a good sign. Even though it was a split decision at the end, close fight. I still think Damon Jackson won that fight, and I, I don't think it was really that close. I think it was 29-28 Damon Jackson. So, yeah. Um, as for the other plays, I mean, you guys got to hit up Alex and Top G for some of those plays. But, um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, overall, we just had a bad night. I mean, minus two units on bet MMA tips. And that's just not something that we want, obviously. So we're going to try to tune and, you know, tweak and really go ham for UFC 300 because, you know, we, we really need that momentum. And I feel that UFC 300 will provide a lot of good opportunities that could be good plays. And I, I think that we're going to get back on track right away. So I'm excited to just go ahead and start this breakdown of UFC 300. I'm excited for really all the plays that they have here. Let's move on to UFC 300 breakdown. And we'll go over to the first fight right here. So. 
every fight on this card is going to be pretty good. I mean, there's some high quality fights, high quality fighters on this card. You know, we have former champions. Speaking of former champions, we literally have two former champions right off the bat. We have Devson Figueroa versus Cody Garbrandt. Figgy, 22-3-1. He is coming off that win against Rob Font via decision where he 30 27 him. Cody Garbrandt, 14-5. He is 3-2 and two in his last five. He's coming off that KO victory over Brian Kelleher. Let's check out the odds for this right now. We have Figgy at minus 300, opened up at minus 300. So there was some movement there where he was minus 400 at one point. But he's since settled back to where the opening odds are. Yeah, I, I got to go with Figgy here. Give me him as a lock. I, I think that Figgy is a safe parlay piece, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I've been looking to to fade Cody Garbrandt uh, for a, a bit now. I mean, I, I'm a fan of Cody Garbrandt, actually. I love his skill set. You know, he has some good boxing, and he's a solid wrestler as well. You know, he has 80% takedown defense. He can also mix in some takedowns. As well, you know, he has 34% takedown accuracy. So he's, he's a solid vet, right? The former champion. I just think that the the chin and the durability of a Cody Garbrandt, it, it's been long gone. It's gone now. I mean, he is in danger of being finished with any clean strike, any clean shot that touches him on the chin. I think you have to hold your breath. I, I remember I was on Cody as a minus 200 favorite against his uh, Trevin Jones against in that fight. And although he won that fight, man, I've been really looking to fade him ever since because Trevin did catch him with some clean shots throughout the fight, and Cody did not react well to those shots, right? I mean, he, he Cody did a great job of incorporating the grappling to secure the decision win, but the the gap between a Trevin Jones or a, a Brian Boom Boom Keller... <laughs> Um, it, it's wide. When you compare it to a former champion like Figgy, Figgy just 30-27 Rob Font in, you know, his 135 debut. And Rob Font, this, I mean, this is MMA math, right? But Rob Font 50-45 Cody three years ago. Uh, so MMA, MMA math is never really that simple, right? There's always some factors. Styles makes fights. I understand that. But to prove my point, I mean, after Cody was 50-45 against Font, he was actually KO'd in round one against Kari Kara France when he went down to lightweight. So, you know, I think that the, the trajectory just is not there for Cody. I mean, he's been given two fights where he was really the, the massive favorite just based on, like, skill set and skill and just really not much danger coming back at him. So... I think the UFC has just been propping up Cody, giving him Trevin Jones and Brian Kelleher. And I really think this is a sell moment for Cody right here. I think that this they're going to use that name value to prop up a guy like Figgy who might be going on a champion run right now. I think you know he's a former 125 champion. I think that he, he's going to probably make a championship run at uh, 135 as well. So yeah, give me Figgy. Minus 300 right now. I think it's a solid parlay piece. The pick, the official pick is going to be Figgy via club and sub. I think that's how he's going to get it done. And yeah, I, I would love to just parlay him as well. I think he's a, going to be a good parlay piece. Let's move on to the next fight that we have on the prelims. And this is going to be a matchup between Bobby Green versus Jim Miller. And this is going to be a, another interesting fight. I mean, we have Bobby Green, 31-15-1. He's coming off of that KO, the vicious KO loss to Jalen Turner, where he took a lot of and just absorbed a lot of damage in a KO. Um, fighting against Jim Miller, 37-17, 4-1 in his last five, and he's actually coming off a submission victory over Gabriel Benitez. Let's look at the odds for this fight right here. We have Bobby Green at minus 180, opened up at minus 110. Th this is going to be a tricky fight to break down and to really cap. I mean, Bobby Green, I just, I, I will have to side with Bobby Green in this matchup. I, I just can't trust him with any potential units or any plays. I mean, he's, he's really coming off of that brutal KO loss. Like, that was a really vicious loss that he's coming off of. I, I think that this is going to be a fight 
of two aging vets and Jim Miller honestly has just been showing a better trajectory than Green. I mean, Green is going to be the the better striker on the feet. And I think that if his chin and durability hold up, he should be able to cruise to decision victory. But man, I, I just feel that, you know, Miller, he, he's a grappler, right? He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu grappler. And, you know, I, I just don't think that Miller will be able to use that wrestling or that take those takedowns to really implement a submission game so you know bobby should be able to stay safe in this fight and if it's a stand-up fight i i do favor bobby green just because he's the better boxer he's gonna be the better kickboxer in this matchup the, the worry that i obviously have is that you know jim has proven to still have power in his hands and with bobby's declining durability and his hands down kind of style of striking I, I think that Bobby could look good until he gets dropped at any moment in this fight. Very similarly to how he lost to Drew Dober. He was looking great against Drew Dober, and Drew Dober just caught him with a really big bomb, and that's all, that was all she wrote. So the pick here is going to be Bobby, but via decision, I do think that he's going to be able to outpoint, you know, outslick Jim Miller on the feet. But there's no way I can trust him coming off of the. Uh, the very vicious knockout loss they had to Jalen Turner. So yeah, I'm, I'm passing on this fight overall. Let's move on to the next fight on the prelims. And we have our first women's fight of the night. We have Jessica Andrade versus Marina Rodriguez. Andrade, she is 25 and 12. She is coming off a win against Mackenzie Dern at UFC 298. Facing off against Marina Rodriguez, seventeen three and two. She's coming off that KO victory over, and it was a very dominant KO victory actually, over Karate Hottie Michelle Waterson. Let's look at the odds for this. So there's been some line movement actually. Andrade opened up at a pick'em. There was a one point where she was an underdog, and now she's a minus one thirty seven favorite. So it's kind of a slight favorite there. I I'm actually going to go with Marina Rodriguez in this fight. I I think that. The, it's a dog or pass fight for me, right? I mean, I think that both these ladies are you know pretty decent, especially on the feet. I, I just think that Marina is going to be the better striker here, and I believe that she will land the cleaner shots for the majority of the fight. You know, Jessica is just not technical enough on the feet, and I think that she's just too much of a plotter for me to trust her as a favor in this matchup, which should be mostly striking. Marina looked great in her last fight in the KO victory over Michelle Watterson. And I, I really do believe that she'll try to continue that momentum into this fight. Jessica also looked great, uh, but, you know, her, her opponent, Mackenzie Dern, I mean, that's like the perfect fighter to pick apart on the feet. And she, even Jessica Andrade has much better stand-up than Mackenzie Dern. So I, I see this fight going similarly to Jessica's KO loss to Yan Zaunan. I just don't think that I, I do think that it'll go the distance though. I don't think she's gonna get knocked out again. So I don't trust either women woman to actually lay units on them. You know, I don't have high confidence in either of them. I, I do really think that this is a pick and fight, and in that case, I would rather have the plus odds. So whether that's Marina Rodriguez right now at plus one seventeen, or when Jessica Andrade was plus one hundred, I think this is a dog or pass fight and you know, get the value of the dog. Uh, otherwise, just pass on it. Let's move on to the next fight on the prelims. We have a this is going to be a banger. We have Jalen Turner versus Renato Moicano, and I think that this has potential to be one of the fight of the nights right here. I mean, Jalen Turner he is fourteen and seven. He is coming off that once again really dominant KO victory over Bobby Green. Facing off against Renato Moicano, Money Moicano, 18, 5, and 1, 4 and 1 in his last five. He's coming off that decision victory over Drew Dober about two months ago. Let's look for the odds for this fight. We have Jalen Turner at minus 230, opened up at minus 250. So there's been some dog action taken uh, on Renato Moicano here. Uh, yeah, I do think this is going to be a fight night potential. Both these guys, you know, really like to really like to go for the finish, right? I mean, in, in both uh, two different styles, obviously. I'm, I'm going to pick Jalen Turner in this fight. And to me, at least, uh, he is a potential lock for me. I, I think that Moicano, 
he's built up a lot of hype over the last you know few few years or past year since he's come back and he's gained a lot of fans with his you know post fight mic performances i mean he's great on the mic he has a great growing social media presence the Makano militia um you know I, I think that i just think that with all those factors this is a sell high on Moicano and a buy low on Turner i mean i Turner is not a fighter that a lot of fans know about i mean but after a highlight finish on Moicano i, I think that a lot of the fans that follow Moicano will learn about Jalen Turner I, I believe that Turner would just be too much for Moicano on the feet you know we could be in store for a quick finish here like how Bobby Green got finished i i i do think that Moicano's best best path is to, you know, obviously grapple his way to victory for the majority of the fight and just hope to find the sub that way. I just do not believe that he will have success here as you know, Turner is a beast physically. I mean, this guy is 6'3", 77 inch reach. That's probably the biggest frame at lightweight. I, and he has a solid 75% takedown defense. I mean, I, I really think that his defensive grappling is also improved. You know, he does get held down at times, but he, he does a great job of getting back up. So I, I think that Moicano just has one too many chin issues for me to back. You know, he, he's had, he's been pieced up on the feet and been knocked out in his last decision win over Drew Dober. He had to do a lot of laying prey to, to win that fight. Right. And I think that Turner Turner is just going to have the physical and technical tools on the feet. And I really think that he just has a good chance of really chinning Moicano here. So give me Jalen Turner via KO. I think he's a potential parlay piece. But, you know, for now, I'm going to monitor line movement, see if we can get better odds. But I, I do think that that's a solid play as far as uh, Jalen Turner minus 230. I think that's something solid right there. Let's move on to the next fight here that we have on the prelims. And we have another potential banger right here. So we have Sadiq Yusuf versus Diego Lopez. Sadiq Yusuf, he is 13 and 3. He is 3 and 2 in his last five. And he's actually coming off the loss in his main event debut against Edson Barbosa. Diego Lopez, 23 6. He is 4-1 in his last five, and he's actually coming off that KO victory over Pat Sabatini. Let's move on to the odds for this fight right here. We have Lopez at minus 135. So he, op he opened up at minus 170, but now he's since minus 135. I mean, I think there's some been some dog action taken on Sadiq Yusuf, and I actually agree with that. Um, so... You know, Sadiq Yusuf is a, uh, <laughs> I had my first introduction to him uh, really as as I laid the juice on him versus Edson Barbosa, and it looked great in round one, right? This guy 10 8 you know, Edson Barbosa. It looks like he was about to finish him, honestly. And then this guy just gassed out. Um, he lost rounds two through five. He got uh, knocked down himself, got rocked. Um, so, you know, that wasn't a great experience for, for me and Sadiq Yusuf, but you know, I do think that this being a three round fight, it, it's going to benefit Sadiq because he does have that tendency to gas later on the fight goes. I mean, he's he's been gassing sometimes in, in three round fights. So I don't think he's a five, five round fighter as we saw in that last fight against Edson Barbosa. I just like Sadiq's chances to keep this on the feet, um, you know, and not really engage with Lopez on the ground. Right. In the last few matchups that we've seen Lopez have, he's been fighting guys that have been you know, trying to engage with him in the ground, right? He's been fighting Pat Sabatini, Gavin Tucker, Mozart Evloyev. I mean, all these guys are grapple heavy and want to take it to the ground. And they really played into Diego Lopez's strength, which is also his grappling, his jiu-jitsu. I think that Sadiq will be smart enough to realize that that's not his best path to victory. And, you know, although... Lopez is no slouch on the feet. I think he is a good striker as well. I do think that this will be the best striker that Lopez has faced. And I do believe that Sadiq is more technical on the feet than him. I think that Lopez, is to take it to the ground, he's either going to have to pull guard or shoot for takedowns in this fight and bring it to the ground. And I really do believe that Sadiq will have a good chance of just keeping it on the feet. 
and staying safe. Now, the the one big concern that I have on Sadiq and, and the reason why I probably will not play him is that he does have a tendency to leave his chin open and you know just leave himself open to strikes in general. And I, I think that that's a dangerous recipe for against a guy like Diego Lopez, who has some underrated power and he has some wild power as well. You know, power that you don't see come. I mean, um, the fight against Edson Barbosa, I think Edson Barbosa, although obviously a more technical striker than either of these guys, he did like a spinning wheel kick or <laughs> spinning heel kick or something like that. And it caught Sadiq by surprise. So I can imagine that Lopez has something nasty and something wild for Sadiq and he might not see it coming and he could get KO'd or rocked or dropped because of that. So that'll be the one concern I have for Sadiq and that's why I'm probably not going to back him. But, and also obviously his tendency to gas later on in the fight. I mean, that gives me some major head and see as well. So I, I'm not trusting Sadiq. I, I do think that he's going to win via decision and that's going to be my pick, but I, I probably wouldn't go anywhere near him, to be honest. And we'll just have to kind of watch and see how this fight goes. Let's move on to the next fight on the prelims. We have Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison. And this is going to be Kayla Harrison's UFC debut, obviously. Holly Holm, the preacher's daughter. I mean, we all know about her. She is 15 and 6. She is coming off that no contest against Mile Bueno Silva, where she was, you know, choked out, but they called it a no contest because Bueno Silva tested positive for like some Ritalin or something. So I guess they called it a no contest, but she did get choked out in that second round. Um, Kayla Harrison, 16-1, 4-1 in her last five, and she's coming off that decision victory over Aspen Ladd, who is who also fought in the UFC. So moving on to the odds, and this is going to get juicy here. I mean, Kayla Harrison is now a minus 435. She opened up at a minus 375. Um, you know, she's pretty juiced as far as a favorite. And I I do uh, tend to agree with that line movement. I mean, man, Kayla Harrison, she's an Olympic medalist, right, in, in judoka. And I have to pick Kayla Harrison in this matchup. You know, I... I don't I will I won't have any plays on her because this is literally her UFC debut, right? I mean, that's a little dangerous to trust, especially in the women's division. And she's cutting to 135 after fighting at like 155. I mean, she fought at like 155 in women's MMA. So, you know, this is gonna be a pretty big cut for her. You know, Holly is a quintessential UFC vet especially in the 135 division. She has all the skills that you would want in a former champion. And, you know, lately she's been using just a lot of cage pushing and clinching to, to win the fight. Now, I, I believe that the difference in this matchup would just be the sheer physicality of an in her prime Kayla Harrison. Holly Holm is 42 years old now. I mean, that's, that's that's a little up there. I mean, we just saw another former champion take an L in Jermaine Duranamy, right? I mean, that was coming off a three and a half years layoff. But um, you know, the older you get, you just don't you don't get better usually in the UFC and the MMA, especially. So it just becomes so hard to stay at the top the older you get. And I really feel that Holmes' last loss was the beginning, the end. If this was a few years ago, I think Holm actually would have won her last fight by a wide margin against Bueno Silva, right? But now that we see, you know, she's past her physical prime, I just feel like she's going to be more, like, prone to the losses where the other opponent is a better athlete than her. I mean, unfortunately, Kayla's going to be the much better athlete, and she's in her prime, and Kayla is a former two-time Olympic gold medalist in judo, and has fought regularly in the 150, 155 pound division. I mean, I, I just think Kayla is going to be able to outbeast home, home from the start and either lay and pray to a decision victory or find a sub. I mean, the things that Holly does well, which is the clinch and the cage push at this point, that's literally going to Kayla Harrison's wheelhouse. So she's going to have to turn back the clock and really fight more of a kickboxing kind of style and I just don't think she's going to be able to do it at age 42. So, yeah, give me Kayla Harrison via decision for now. I'm going to hold off. I, I just, I'm I'm not going to play Kayla Harrison any place. I mean, there's just too many factors here, too many unknowns. 
for it to be a safe play for me. So yeah, I'm passing on this fight. Let's move on to the next prelim on the uh, the next fight in the prelims. We have Calvin Cater versus Aljamain Sterling. This is going to be Aljo's featherweight debut at 145. We have right here, uh, you know, Calvin Cater, 23 and seven. He is actually two and three in his last five. And he's coming off that loss against Arnold Allen. So, you know, that's going to be a pretty long layoff for him. And he had that kind of knee injury during that fight as well. So we'll see how he comes back from that. Al Jermaine Sterling, 23 and four. He is four and one his last five. And he's coming off of that loss against Sugar Sean O'Malley via KO. So let's look at the odds for this fight as well. We have Al Jermaine Sterling at minus 165 open up at a minus 105 so there has been some action taken on Calvin Cater especially in the beginning but each time that Aljo has become a dog he's instantly shot down back down to a favorite and now he's actually you know kind of decent sized favorite almost a two to one favorite right here man I'm I'm gonna have to side with Aljo here um you know I I, I give me Aljo in the spot I just think that Aljo will be too relentless of a grappler and too quick twitch for Qatar. I mean, uh, Qatar, you know, he's coming off a one and a half year layoff due to a blown out knee. And I don't think Calvin Qatar was really an, a quick twitch high level athlete before the, the knee injury. And now I believe that he will come in and just look rusty and less athletic in his first action in a year and a half. So, you know, Calvin's obviously the better boxer on the feet. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I just don't believe he has the movement and finishing ability that is dangerous for Aljo. I mean, usually Aljo has had trouble with guys who, you know, have that kind of dangerous movement and finishing ability, like a Sean O'Malley or a Marlon Marais even. But I really see this fight going down the path of Aljo just throwing some funky stuff, you know, some quick stuff unorthodox strikes and closing the distance on Qatar and just shooting for takedowns relentlessly. I mean, I, I think he's going to really come out with a Marab like game plan, right? I think he's going to shoot for like 20 plus takedowns and you know, this it's going to test Qatar's 91% takedown defense. I mean, that's a really good stat, but this is going to be the first fighter that Calvin has faced where their grappling is going to be plan a B and C. I mean, I, I think that he's going to have to sh like stuff takedowns the whole fight. And I think he's going to be a little rusty coming off that knee injury. So, you know, this go does go against my kind of a uh, thesis of a, a new meta on the judges scorecards, right? Where they, you know, they like damage or control, but there is one point that I like to make is that the judges they still have favored control when the fighter is able to backpack their opponents or threaten with subs which is what Aljo's game is all about I mean we saw a fighter like uh, Brandon Allen have success with Chris Curtis taking him down and taking his back although he didn't control him of the whole fight the judges still like that and gave some rounds to Brandon Allen just based off of that getting takedowns and controlling the back so I think as long as you know, Aljo just doesn't like cage push or just keep Qatar in the in the cage, but actually take his back and take him down at times and control him. I think they're going to give and bank those rounds to Aljo. And I feel that he's going to do that for the majority of the fight. And he, he's going to look, he's going to feel and look much stronger and quicker at 145 because he doesn't have to cut that weight. And I, I guarantee you Aljo is going to feel strong in this fight. So he's going to go ahead and try to test that right away especially with a Calvin Qatar who's coming off that knee injury and you know it's going to be some ring rust for him and he's going to have to get used to it. So yeah, give me Aljo via decision. I actually think he's a solid money line play, uh, potential let, let me see what the decision odds are because I feel like that dropped already. Sterling to win via decision is plus 135. So I mean, you know, it's already kind of at that point um it was minus 1 through okay. Yeah, I think Aljo via decision is a solid play, honestly. Um, you know, he hasn't really subbed anybody in, in a while, but I still think that, um, you know, this fight's probably going to go decision and Aljo's going to bank some rounds off of the uh, the backpack style that he has. Let's move on to the next fight that we have on the prelims. 
we have the feature prelim of the night, actually. We have Yuri Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. And Rakic is going to be, this is his first fight since that, his uh, brutal knee, knee injury. So Yuri Prohaska, 29-4-1. He's 4-1 and his last five. He's coming off that KO loss to Alex Perea, obviously, for the title about four months ago. Fighting against Rakic, 14-3. 3-2 in his last five. And he's coming off of that, obviously, the knee injury or the leg injury to Jan Pahovic about almost two years ago. Let's look at the odds for this fight right here. We have Rakic at minus 124, and he opened up at a pick him. So there has been some just very slight action on Rakic's favorite here. Yeah, I'm not really understanding the, uh, the line here um, unless... Maybe I'm missing something from Rockage, <laughs> but um, I, I think Yuri should be the favorite in this matchup. I mean, I, I really liked your Yuri as an underdog as well. I mean, every fight with Yuri, right? He turns into a, he turns the fight into a 50 50 fight, and he does win most of these fights. Obviously, the last one he lost, but Yuri has the special ability to make every fight turn into an all action brawl and. I just don't think that this is the type of fight that Rackage excels at. I mean, Rackage likes to fight a clean, technical, kickboxing kind of fight where he uses his kicks, you know, can mix in some takedowns um, to secure a decision win. I, I just think that Yuri's going to be in Rackage's face from the start and force Rackage to start shooting takedowns. And even if Rackage is able to land the takedowns, I like the fact that Yuri was able to survive and thrive on the ground against a guy like Glover Teixeira. I mean, Rakic is going to be the bigger guy here as far as uh, just his frame, uh, obviously bigger than, you know, uh, Glover Teixeira. But I think Yuri just has shown a good ability to stay safe on the ground and work his way back up to fight his fight. I give Yuri the higher finishing equity in this fight, and I really like his chances of scoring on the scorecards based on... Once again, them favoring the damage as opposed to lay prey control, which is what Rackage will likely do with his takedowns. I mean, he's not a sub threat. He's only had one submission win in his career. Um, so I, I don't think the sub will be there for year for a Rackage. So yeah, give me Yuri via KO. I, I really like him as a solid underdog. Um, you know, plus one oh four right now. I think that's a that's still a solid play. I'll still make Yuri a favorite in this matchup. So yeah. I like I like Yuri as a play there. Let's move on to the main card. And yeah, this is going to be an interesting uh, opener for the main card. You know, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. I mean, Bo Nickel, 5-0. and He's coming off that KO victory over Val Woodburn. Facing off against Cody Brundage, 10-5. 10-5. He is uh, coming off of that KO victory over Zach Reese where he slammed him. Um, Let's look at the odds for this fight. I mean, minus 2,300, uh, you know, open up at minus 1,400. Yeah, I mean, there's there's not really much to say about this fight, honestly. Um, I'm not going to, you know, spend too much time on this. I think Bo is going to win by whatever he wants. Um, there's just no way we can play him. I mean, minus 2,300, it's just like no value left in adding him to a parlay. Um I, I do think that even though let's let's say that if someone wanted to play the you know, under one and a half, right? I think that could even get wrecked because this could turn into like a grapple fest, right? I mean, minus three ten right now. I, I don't see much value in that one either. So I'm just gonna overall pass on this fight, and we'll move on to the next one. But I I see Bo finishing Cody Brundage inside the distance, um, most likely in the first round or second round. So yeah. Let's move on to the next fight, and uh, this is going to be, for me at least, the start of the actual main card, because uh, you know there's going to be some competitive fights down here, and you know I, I think that this is, I think that this is going to be the the toughest fight for me to actually cap, um, because you know we have two guys who are on a collision course for the lightweight championship. You know we have Charles Oliveira du Bronx versus. Armin Sarukian. You know, Charles Oliveira, 34 and 9. He is 4 and 1 his last five is coming off that KO victory over Benil Dariush, where he was an underdog, believe it or not. Fight against Armin Sarukian, 21 and 3, 4 and 1 his last five. He is also coming off a KO finish over Benil Dariush. 
Let's look at the odds for this fight right now. We have Armin Sarukian at minus 225, opened up at a minus 200. Man, um, I mean, like I mentioned, I think that this is going to be the toughest fight on the card for me to break down at the cap. Right now, I'm leaning towards Armin Sarukian in this spot. And the only reason why I'm not confident in him, one of the only reasons is that I have been burned by Charles Oliveira three times. Um, I picked Benio Darius, Justin Gaethje, and Dustin Poirier to beat this guy. And I did pick Islam to beat him, so that's the only time that I worked out. Um, but I think that picking Benio Darius especially was like the worst pick that I ever made in my life. Um, you know, I overestimated every single facet of Benio's game. And really underestimated Charles in that spot heavily. I thought that he was a changed guy coming off of a sub loss to Islam. And I mean, looking back at it, I, that was just a horrible pick. But I'm going to try to make the case for Armin here. I think there are going to be a couple factors of why I like Armin. So first off, I, I think that Armin will be similar to Islam on the basis that he will be able to stay safe on the ground. And just be able to utilize the top control and his own grappling to win points and minutes in this fight. You know, Charles, he's been able to exploit the top game and control game of, you know, his opponents in his last few fights. Um, you know, they've had some holes there. And the one opponent that he's had trouble with was Islam. And he had, you know, he didn't have the advantage there. I mean, I think in the fight with Benil, Charles was, you know, if you look back at it, Charles was taken down, but he he was eventually just able to get up because he was throwing some good elbows on the ground and not taking too much damage from Benio. And Benio doesn't really have a good top game, right? He's more of a bottom game, jiu-jitsu kind of fighter, kind of a, a sprawl kind of guy. So I, I think that, you know, Benio, he has more success against guys like a Gamrod, for example. Um, and I, I think that, you know, Armin's going to have a better top game. And obviously he has the takedowns in this, in this matchup. He's going to be able to secure takedowns and take Charles down as well. And, you know, second reason is I really do think that Armin is coming into his prime right now in terms of his physicality. I mean, he's what, like 20, like seven, 28. And Charles is, you know, 34. Obviously, I don't think Charles has really shown signs of decline yet, but I do believe that he's closer to the end of his prime, and he's been rocked and in danger in all of his fights in the last few years, maybe except for the Benil Dariush one. <laughs> but, you know, he's been rocked, been in danger, and those guys really just didn't follow him to the ground, right? And I feel that Armin really showed some good signs of good improving stand-up, and if he rocks Charles on the feet, because I, I think he will in this matchup, because Charles just doesn't have the best head movement. I mean, he just keeps his head in the center line. I mean, it allows him to throw with some good power because he stays on balance. Um, but I think that his head is, is going to be there for Armin to, uh, to attack with his quick strikes. And really, Armin has some underrated power, as we saw in his last fight. So with all these factors... I think that, you know, although Charles is a, probably the most entertaining fighter in the UFC, just because of his style and his, like, pace and pressure, especially in the first and second round, I mean, I just think that that is not a good recipe for the long term as he gets older, and that's why I'm picking Armin via KO. Um, but, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to play this fight. I think that I just don't have that good of a read on... Charles Oliveira, especially. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the picker is going to be Armin, but I'm, I'm probably going to pass on this fight overall. Let's move on to the next fight that we have on the main card, and we have our first title fight. This is going to be for the BMF belt. So, you know, an, a made up kind of belt, but, <laughs> you know, a good fight nonetheless, right? So, Justin Gaethje, the highlight 25 and 4. He's 3 and 2 in his last five, and he's actually coming off that KO victory over Dustin Poirier for that BMF belt about eight months ago. Max Holloway, 25 and seven. He is four and one in his last five. And he's coming off of that KO victory over the Korean zombie. Looking at the odds for this fight, we have Justin Gaethje at minus 175, open up at minus 140. Let's look at, um, yeah, so, man, I, I'm seeing a lot of love for Max Holloway, right? And, um, you know, I think he's a fan favorite, um, but, I got to go Gaethje here uh, in this matchup for the BMF title fight. I mean, 
this is going to be an entertaining fight back and forth exchanges between two warriors who are probably willing to die on their shield. I'm just going to pick Justin because I have seen actually massive improvement from him in his last two fights. Um, you know, gone are the days of him fighting like Homer Simpson. You know, he doesn't just like fight and be reckless anymore. He fights a much more intelligent and efficient uh, kickboxing kind of style now, right? I mean, he throws with less output now, but his defense is also much better. Um, if you look at that fight in, against DP, I mean, his defense was pretty good. He was still getting hit, but I mean, DP is a really good fighter as well. But I mean, we saw that even though he stays more defensive and has less output, he still has that dangerous fight ending KO power, which is something that I think he's going to need in this fight, especially against a guy like um, you know Max Holloway. I also like the fact that he won a decision against Rafael Faziv. You know, it proved his worth among the highest level contenders at 155, where he defended his spot against a up and comer who was hungry. And, you know, Max, you know, I know I know Max is going to be dangerous with his high output style and, you know, legendary durability. And this is a five round fight, right? But really, the same could be said about a guy like Tony Ferguson leading up to his fight against Justin. You know, I, I believe that, you know, obviously Max is going to be the higher level boxer than Tony ever was both offensively and defensively, but I think that legendary chin and durability will be tested in this matchup against uh, you know, Justin Gaethje at lightweight at the 155-pound division. You know, in Max's fight against Dustin Poirier at 155, he was actually rocked multiple times. And to me, he looked to be at a severe power disadvantage. I mean, DP was throwing the much heavier blows, much heavier shots, and... I also don't like the fact that Max was pieced up against Volk the last time they fought. I mean, uh, for the you know featherweight belt, his wins over Arnold Allen and TKZ just don't give me the validity that I need that he's going to be able to withstand the danger that Gaethje has in store for him. So, you know, Max, I do think that he looks more prepared in this second go around at 155, but Man, I think he's going to be in for a rude awakening against one of the most dangerous stand-up strikers the UFC has seen, Justin the Highlight Gaethje. So I got to go Gaethje here. I'm prob I think I'm going to go Gaethje via decision. Um, you know, I'm, I'm giving Max that respect, right? Because uh, I, I do think that he's going to be able to survive. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if Gaethje catches him with a KO. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. So... Pick for me is Gaethje via decision, but yeah, I, I right now I feel comfortable in, in laying Justin Gaethje in a parlay, but you know, we'll have to see. I haven't done anything yet, and we'll we'll see what the week as the week goes on. Cause right now minus one seventy five, I mean, I think that's solid odds for a guy like Gaethje. Let's move on to the co main event of the evening. We have another title fight, and this is gonna be for an actual real title here. We have Zhang Weili versus Yan Zanan. So this is going to be a matchup between two Chinese fighters in the women's division at 115. Zhang Weili, 20-4 and 3. She is 3-2 and two in her last five. And she's actually coming off that dominant decision victory over Amanda Lemos. Yan Zanan, 17-3. and three. She is 3-2 three and two in her last five. She's coming off that KO victory over Jessica Andrade. And as we look at the odds for this fight, we have Zhang Weili at minus 470. Open up at minus 310. Yeah, I mean, Weili, uh, for me, is the most confident pick that I have on this card. I, I think that, I, I really think that she has Yan Zanan covered everywhere in this matchup. Um, you know, she's going to be safe to parlay and play, in my opinion. You know, Yan is a good striker and i think her her grappling has improved you know but whaley is just a different beast in all aspects of ma at this point the grappling that whaley show like showed in her last few bouts have just been spectacular and i really think that she's reached her peak you know a good striker coupled with some fantastic grappling and wrestling i mean she's a do it all right now at, the, at this point and I also like the fact that she's a high IQ fighter, you know, and she's going to take the path of least resistance, which is to wrestle and just hold down Jan for 25 minutes if needed. I mean, we saw that in her last fight against another, you know, dangerous striker in Amanda Lemos. 
she did engage in the striking with Amanda, obviously. And I mean, I think she even won some of those exchanges, but we saw that she just was taking Lamos down at will and holding her down for a decision win. So I don't, I don't think she's going to have an issue doing that in this matchup. I know that, you know, training at Team Alpha Male has improved Jan's grappling a great deal. I think that she's a much better grappler now than she was in her early career. But I just don't think that that training will be enough to overcome the physical mismatch even. I mean, Whaley is built like a tank. I mean, she was picking up with like Shaquille O'Neal and like Francis Naganu. So I just think that she has a much better physicality to her. And, you know, it's going to be difficult for Jan to keep her off of her for the majority of the fight. So give me Whaley via decision. And I think she's a part of the piece. I mean, minus 470, I know it's a little juice, but I think that she's a really safe play in this case. Wish we were able to potentially get her at better odds, but you know, it is what it is at this point. Let's move on to the main event of the evening. And I think this will be a, aside from the Charles Oliveira and Armin Sarukin fight, I think this will be another kind of highly debated fight and in, in the UFC uh, kind of breakdown space. Poitain, Alex Perea, nine and two, four and one, his last five He's coming off that KO victory over Yuri Prohaska. Fencing off against Jamal Hill, 12 and one, four and one in his last five. And he's actually coming off that decision victory over Glover Teixeira, where he won the champion, but he had to vacate it because of his Achilles injury. Let's see what the odds with this fight are. We have Alex Perea at minus 130, and he opened up at a minus 155. So there was some dog action taken on Jamal Hill, and then obviously some favorite action, but now we're getting a little bit more of a dog action on Jamal Hill. So. Man, yeah, this fight's going to be a little tricky. I mean, we have a lot of variables in this fight, um, especially from the Hill side. I think I think there are more variables from the Hill side for sure in this fight. I'm going to go with Poitain to KO Hill in this main event. Um, for me, I just don't like the fact that Hill is coming off of an Achilles injury and he's just coming back after a year. I mean, it is really anyone's guess what his physical and mental shape will be like. I mean, he could be at major risk of ring rust. He's spending a lot of time on social media too, you know, making videos and whatnot. And, you know, I just, I just don't think that, I don't know if his head is all the way there for this title fight, right? And, you know, I, I think that the game plan actually, you know, it may seem like he wants to strike with uh, Perea, right? Because, I mean, that's what everyone says. They they always want to strike with him. But look at his uh, fights and look at his opponents, right? I think that Hill will actually try to grapple Poiton here. I mean, he has to. He has the he has the better grappling in this matchup. I think he has the better wrestling and that's his going to be his path to least resistance is just try to you know grind down Perea, take him down and just grind on him and make him less dangerous for this five round fight. You know, the, the one person that actually did this was Jan Bohovic and look at what Jan Bohovic did. I mean, I think that was like a split decision. So, you know, like it was a very close fight. I still scored it for Alex, obviously, um, and I actually had Alex in that fight, but it was a split decision. It was close. So, you know, I think incorporating that grappling in this case could could really benefit Jamal Hill. Um, everyone really has had limited success striking versus Alex Perea, aside from Israel Adesanya. And while I do believe that Hill is a, you know, a good striker, and should have the grappling advantage here. I just don't think that his striking is as good as Izzy's, honestly. I think Izzy is the better striker. And I just don't think his grappling, even though he has a better grappling advantage, I don't think it will be enough to throw off Poitain's strength. It's going to be similar to how, you know, Jan Bohovic, uh tried to grapple uh, Poitain. I mean, Jan Bohovic is not a grappler himself. And, you know, he was able to take him down, but really wasn't able to threaten with subs or really hold him down too long. So I think the same thing is going to happen in this fight. The calf kicks and the leg kicks for Perea, I think they're going to be crucial in this matchup, especially with a guy in Hill who's coming off a devastating Achilles injury about a year ago. So the one concern I do have on Alex Perea is that he just absorbs a lot of strikes. I mean, one too many for my taste. And the kind of strikes that he's absorbs are like just powerful strikes as well. I mean, we saw what happened with Izzy. I mean, he was eating those shots from Izzy like candy in that last matchup they had. Um, so, you know, 
I do like the fact that Perea has moved up to 205, though. I mean, I think that this has, you know, kind of rejuvenated his overall chin and durability. And, you know, he doesn't have to cut 40 pounds to make 185 anymore. Just has to cut like maybe 20, 30 pounds to make 205. So I'm siding with Poitain here. He's been the much more active fighter, obviously. And I, I just think that he's the, the fighter that is the rightful favorite. And I would trust him in this spot more so than trusting Jamal Hill with, you know, all of his question marks. So, yeah, give me Alex via KO. I actually think he's a solid money line play here. That about does it for the UFC 300 breakdown. I think this is going to be one of the best cards of the year. You know, at first people thought that it might not have been a good card, but honestly, after seeing a lot of these fights and, you know, I think they did a good job. I mean, every fight on this card is going to be a quality fight, in my opinion. There's going to be some quality fighters, maybe except for the Cody Burnish fight, but, you know, Bo Nickel, obviously, they're just going to showcase, showcase Bo Nickel there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that is going to be a fun card. You know, best of luck to everybody. Obviously, we're going to be on the lookout for spots that we can play here. Obviously, purepicks.gg. That's how you guys sign up for some of the plays. We're going to carry some momentum. We're going to try to create that momentum for this week and really ride into UFC 300 with some good plays. So hopefully everyone cashes this week. Best of luck, everybody. We'll see you guys soon.